Hi, I'm Moose, and unless you've got any radioactive spiders or super soldier serums lying around, the closest I'll ever get to living out my superhero dreams is through the comfort of a controller. Is this more action than even Spider-Man can handle? Whoa! Superheroes are constantly evolving, and every game they star in is a snapshot of whatever comic storyline or blockbuster movie defined the current era. In our new series, we're going to explore the context of comic book computer games and see which ones are still worth your time. So hold on to your balloons, reset the computer, and welcome to die, because now you're playing with powers. And since there's a hugely hyped new game just around the corner, we're devoting our first four-part season to the amazing Spider-Man. From the 2600 to the PlayStation 4, the Web Slinger has graced countless consoles and arcade cabinets, so let's get right into the swing of things with part one, 1982 to 1992. Spidey got his first video game in 1982, at the height of the Atari age. <laughs> The Amazing Spider-Man on the Atari 2600 wasn't just the first Spider-Man game, it was the first Marvel game, period, kicking off a legacy that would lead directly to Insomniac's upcoming adventure. Don't expect any quips or QTEs in this debut, however. You slowly web-sling up a building, avoiding criminals, defusing bombs, and battling the Green Goblin who you can't actually defeat. If you don't run out of fluid, you'll eventually reach the top, then start over on an identical building. Holy <laughs> you're running out of fluid! <laughs> Still, the gameplay is fairly complex for the era, and the graphics are simple but recognizable. It doesn't appear to be based on any specific comics, since by 1982, Norman Osborn had been dead for almost a decade, his son Harry had given up the glider, and the Hobgoblin wouldn't debut for another year. It just goes to show that, even after his iconic death, the Goblin was still considered Spider-Man's number one nemesis. Remember, Venom hadn't been created yet, and it'd be pretty tough to animate Doc Ock's tentacles with 128 bytes of RAM. Two years after the Atari game, Spider-Man appeared on early PCs. Scott Adams' Quest Pro was a 1984 series of text adventure games starring a variety of Marvel heroes, which mostly consisted of staring at still images as you typed instructions like Go North and Punch Lizard into a frustrating text parser. Stop the typing! Stop the typing! Stop the typing! Several of Spidey's rogues show up to stand perfectly still as you type commands at them as you race to collect a bunch of gems for Madam Web, who was still a new and extremely minor character in the comics at the time, well before the animated series made her seem way more important than she actually is. Two more Spider-Man PC games were released in this era, a puzzle platformer on the Amiga where Spidey tracked Mysterio through movie-themed rooms, and Spider-Man and Captain America in Doctor Doom's Revenge. It was a simple 2D fighter with the story told through comic panels where Cap and Spidey battle through a mix of Z-list villains on their way to destroy Doctor Doom. And once you topple the Latvian tyrant, George H.W. Bush himself offers his personal congratulations. Oakley dokley, thankily dankily. Great delicious, scrub doodle terrific. Despite the presidential endorsement, Spider-Man games didn't truly become mainstream until the 16-bit era. Spidey's first appearance on a 16-bit console wasn't actually in a Spider-Man game, it was in Revenge of Shinobi. Sega's ninja side-scroller included all sorts of copyright-infringing characters as bosses, like Godzilla, the Terminator, Batman, and yes, Spider-Man. Subsequent releases eliminated the copycats, but since Sega had the Spidey license, he got to stay. Speaking of Sega, if you had a Genesis, you more than likely owned Spider-Man vs. the Kingpin. Two-thirds of everyone who had the system bought this game, which was a surprisingly deep simulation of the life of Peter Parker. He could hang out in his apartment to restore his health, snap photos to pay for that expensive web fluid, and deal with a particularly cranky J. Jonah Jameson. I'm Jameson. Who and what are you? The plot involved the Kingpin unleashing a nuclear bomb on New York City. What a night! All this talk about nuking the city's got this town crazier than usual. And that's saying a lot. Yeah, yeah, sure, Sarge. Forcing Spidey to run through a gauntlet of his deadliest foes, including Venom in his first video game appearance. Don't count me out yet, Spider-Man! <laughs> In 1991, Sega followed up its success with a little-known arcade game simply called Spider-Man, which was a side-scrolling beat-em-up in the vein of Konami's X-Men and Ninja Turtles series. But unlike those merry teams of mutant teens, Spidey has always been a loner, Dottie, a rebel. 
so Sega had to fill in some gaps to make the multiplayer action possible. Black Cat was an obvious choice for backup, and even if Hawkeye's kind of a stretch, I'm sure Clint wouldn't have a problem helping out a reserve Avenger. What are you doing here? Disappointing my kids. I'm supposed to go water skiing. But the fourth slot makes no sense. When I think of the low-key, street-level superheroics of Spider-Man, the last character on my mind is the Submariner. Namor is too unhinged, too powerful, and too full of himself to pal around with a punk from Queens. Hey, hi, Prince. Uh, going to the party? I was under the impression the gathering was for super beings, not super freaks. The arcade brawler has some interesting ideas for the era, like how the camera zooms out for wall crawling platforming challenges, but it never achieved the success of games like The Simpsons or Sunset Riders. Back on home consoles, Spidey had started showing up on systems by Nintendo. In 1990, Spider-Man made his portable debut in a side-scroller on the OG green Game Boy. It's a fairly typical game for the era. You walk to the right, punch bad guys, and fight a boss at the end of each level. But it's got a little more personality than most Game Boy games with cool little cutscenes where Spidey and a supervillain talk shit to each other on walkie-talkies. It's little touches like that that would eventually make developer Rare famous, and the music from future Donkey Kong Country composer David Wise is definitely a highlight. Sadly, Rare didn't work on the next two Game Boy games in the series, and the quality definitely declined with each one. Spidey's first and only NES outing came at the tail end of the system's lifespan with The Return of the Sinister Six. It was based on the recent comic storyline of the same name and used Eric Larson's artwork for cutscenes and even the cover. The only exception was the ending screen, which was actually taken from Steve Ditko's first appearance of The Sinister Six. That's about as pretty as the game gets, though. For something released in 1992, it pales in comparison to what other developers could achieve with the NES's outdated hardware. And compared to the then-new Super Nintendo, The Sinister Six straight up sucked. Speaking of the SNES, the last game we're covering today debuted on the platform the same year before being ported over to the Genesis, Game Gear, and Game Boy. Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge. Tired of the same old fun and games? <laughs> Welcome Spider-Man X-Men to the video game ride of your lives. Wolverine, Spider-Man, Gambit, Cyclops. Now on Genesis, the ultimate video game team. It was a simpler time before billion dollar corporations had divvied up the rights to every single comic book character and Spidey could just team up with Marvel's misunderstood mutants without making any headlines. Arcade's Revenge was inspired by a comic that came out 20 years earlier, during the legendary Burn Claremont run on the X-Men. The game updated the source material with the team's current costumes and members like Gambit, who didn't actually exist back then. Everyone can relax. Gambit has returned. It keeps the general concept of garbage trucks getting the jump on highly trained heroes and trapping them in Murder World, Arcade's self-proclaimed Disneyland of Death. But beyond that, the game doesn't follow the story too closely, which means we never get to see Colossus get brainwashed into a Soviet spy called the Proletarian. After beating each hero's individual level, Spidey takes center stage for the climax, facing off against a massive Matryoshka doll as the final boss. Not that I ever got there personally, it was a really, really hard game, but it was nothing compared to the carnage that awaited Spidey as the 90s went on. On the next episode of Playing With Powers, how did Maximum Carnage finally bring comic book storylines to consoles? Why didn't the influential animated series have as big an impact on video games? And what made the spectacular Spider-Man work so well in the third dimension? Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you liked the first episode of Playing With Powers. And now I want to know, who do you think we should cover in future seasons? Should we do Batman games, X-Men games, Superman games? Please don't say Superman games, because then we'd have to talk about Superman 64. Leave a comment, let us know, and as always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd.